Welcome to Free Will, Science, and Religion. I'm Chandler Klebs, and I'm here with my co-hosts George Ortega, David Joseph, and Trick Slattery. And we have some topics to talk about today, such as different definitions of the same terms. That may be different definitions of free will and different definitions of God. And so we can talk about um, how when two people use the exact same word or set of words to mean different things, how do we get past that confusion and come to a conclusion about what is the correct term or the correct meaning of a term? All right, that sounds good. Um, let me start off like basically like I, t I, I consider myself a pantheist in that to me God and the universe are synonymous – and I try to use this within this free will question debate, you know, um, one for, for two different purposes. One is a pragmatic way of like reaching more theists, like you know, 80, 90 percent of Americans are like theists. But secondly, to kind of like answer more fundamental questions in terms of like if, if we, you know, if nothing is up to us, then what, who is it up to and and like, you know, this is related to kind of like issues of kind of like, well, order and, 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 and structure and intelligence. But basically the, the pantheist belief is, is just the idea that if we define God as the universe, I mean, if we define God as, let's say, omnipresent or everywhere, well, then we're defining the universe. That's the exact same definition of the universe. The universe is everything. If we define God as omnipotent, Again, you know, that's the exact same definition of the laws of nature. The law of na laws of nature govern everything. So, and the other, the other reason why I kind of like think this is somewhat important is like, for example, like with the free will debate, you have these compatibilists that are attempting to change the definition of free will to something that that fits with their nonsensical um, understanding of, you know, in other words, like Daniel Dennett, he understands that nothing is up to us. Yes. He wants to like maintain, he wants to co-op the, the term free will for, for, for some kind of like an understanding that, that he's going to hold us fundamentally responsible. So it's confusing. So with, with the God thing, the reason I, I, I advocate for a pantheist, um, version of God is that I think the idea of God was co-opted first by the polytheists and then by the monotheists because like pantheism um, precedes these these other two kind of like uh, uh, religious disciplines. So in other words, just just as we would want to fight for kind of like the uh, the right and proper definition of free will, the idea of seeing the universe and God as synonymous is a similar attempt to not allow you know, monotheism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, to co-opt God, to change the meaning of God from what it originally meant and from what, 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 it's, what, what makes sense, what, what seems to be validated by reason. Well, you know, George, I'm really glad you said that because here's the deal. It looks like from your view, pantheism was the original, the more historical way back there definition. And then you feel like it's been corrupted by these polytheists and monotheists who have changed it from what it was originally meant to be. Exactly. For example, one of the um, definitions they, that they um, now use for God is God is all good. I don't think that was like an original conception of God. And, and you know, that's a clear conflict. In other words, like we, we see things around us. We understand that we do a lot of evil. We know we don't have a free will. I mean, there's hurricanes, there's floods and stuff. So, you know, so again, that's that, you know, the, the monotheists especially have just like redefined God in a way that no longer makes sense. Now, the problem, as I see it, George, is uh, at least, least today, and, and I'm sure back, you know, back in history as well, uh, most people will think of God as some kind of conscious entity. And I think, I think the confusions happen when we start calling God the, the universe uh, with people, people's conception about God being a, a deity or, or some conscious entity. Uh, there, there, there's a conflation that happens between these two things. It, it's the same thing with the whole compatibilist free will. Uh, when, when people um, like Daniel Dennett start defining a compatibilist definition that 
you know, that is just agents, uh, biological agents, um, doing what they desire. That that would be basically be his definition. But he's saying free will exists. So he's telling people free will exists. They're not looking at his definition. They're looking at a, a, an authority figure saying that free will is existing here. And then they're they're taking that back to their own common intuition about free will. Their their belief that they could do could have done otherwise and things like that. And so so it, it just causes too many problems. Uh, so that's why I'm thinking this isn't it's not a good thing to to call you know God the universe because there's so many people. I mean the the majority of the population today is is um religious theists. They're not, not just, you know, um uh, they they believe that in a deity or even more than one deity in some countries. Uh these are conscious entities that they're believing in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chandler. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say something, and like, for example, even if I'm agreed with George, which you know that you know the universe as God may have been a traditional understanding, I understand that in the world we live in now, Trick has a point because the majority of people who talk about God are talking about like deities gods out there that are like people that and that they are that they're like an outer space and that they actually intervene and do things in the world and i don't and so i do think it leads to confusion because those deities that people are already believing in can't be equated with the universe well all right one one way to understand this is like to to understand the um the rationale behind deities. In other words, like back before we had any science, you know, they they saw hurricanes and floods and lightning and rain and, and all this natural phenomenon. And naturally, they didn't have a, a scientific understanding of any of it, you know, of anything that mattered, you know, or that happened, heat, you know, whatever it was. So they being people, you know, they basically kind of like personified or deified um, these forces, you know, from their understanding that they're people and, you know, like, you know, there's, they didn't have the kind of like the materialistic, you know, atoms and molecules and, and understanding that we have. But, but basically they were trying to explain why things happen. So, so, and, and so I think that's, that's, that's still, I think, one of the reasons why people gravitate to um, to religion in, in the sense that it explains the um, reality, not from an an immaterial or not not from a uh, thing, quote unquote, thing based um, understanding, but something that connects them as people more with with what um what what happens. Um, again, I think like. One of the reasons why um, I, I sometimes push the um, the God of the universe pantheistic view and, and you know God is like in control of everything is because I just think from a pragmatic um, perspective it, it's easier to um, to pull people away from thinking that things are up to that, that things are not up to us and things are actually up to God. Than to then to pull them completely from their belief system in God. I think that you know, like going in steps. In other words, I think um, I think the belief in in God is is you know it has been perverted. It has been perverted by religion. For example, like you know, an original belief in God wouldn't have a belief in hell. That like if you believe in God and then some people don't, then you're not condemned to hell. So like, just uh, again, it's it's just another matter of kind of like. Appealing to where people are, and and again defending defending a proper understanding of God, you know, against people who like with the free will debate would um would try to change that definition um so that no it no longer no longer makes sense. Yeah, you know, there's something interesting. There's a big crisis going on in this world, and here's what I mean. That this. This is something, you know, a lot of what happens is the majority of people believe in both free will. But they also believe in a god who's supposedly all-powerful and controls things. And see, here's what happens. If a free will believer in, in God stops believing in God, then they think, oh, it's all up to humans. Humans are responsible. We're in control of our destiny because there's no God. And then 
Another thing, if it happens in the reverse where someone quits believing in free will and they believe it's all up to God, well, then it, it's uh, what I think that does is that that almost causes them to become fatalist as if their actions really don't make a difference. And I mean, I view both the view in, you know, like the monotheistic God that I grew up with um, and, and free will to both be false. And I think it's really hard for people to get to that place. So are you, do you think it's better to um, get rid of the free will belief before getting rid of the belief in God? I, I think um, not so much that it's quote unquote better, um, you know, but I think it's more doable. I think I think that it's, you know, it, from a practical standpoint, I think we have much a much better chance of doing that more quickly than than, you know, pulling people from their belief in God. Oh, I th I, yeah, I think you're right, because um, it's more practical to do that. Because it, I just because it's easier, I think, to understand why free will I, is an illusion. I think I think they're pretty close to, to be to be honest. I, I think um, in in practical terms of, of the ability to be able to get somebody to side with the disbelief in free will or to side with the disbelief in God, um, I think those are pretty. They're not. I mean, they're not insurmountable in, in that some of them. One one isn't uh, easier than the other. I don't. I wouldn't say, uh, especially especially given the fact that um, even when when we re remove the belief in God, and a lot of people they still hold on to this free will belief. Um, this is this is evidentary. No, I, I agree, <laughs> so, Trick. So, yeah, the both are like extremely difficult. Yeah, it's it's not it's not, it's it's hard. It, uh, I mean, some people might it might be easier to remove the God belief before removing the free will belief and vice versa. Some people, it might be easier to remove the free will belief before the God belief. So it's kind of playing to both ends of the, of that type of thing. That's yeah. an excellent point. That's an excellent point. And there's no reason why we, we shouldn't be approaching both, both, um, both strategies. Yeah. Now to me, to me, so for someone like me, um, being secular, be, being someone that doesn't believe in, in a deity or, or, or any type of God, even, even, you know, the pantheist sort, um, that I, I think that because it's based on re rationality, that to me le leads to these other things such as the disbelief in free will. In fact, I, as, as, um, I actually disbelieved in God prior to the belief in free will. So the free will thing came along after I was more of an atheist. <laughs> right. Trick, yeah. I think the reason the reason you don't believe in God is the same reason that Chandler doesn't, that I don't believe in the conventional God, is because it doesn't make sense. In other words, I think the theism that, that atheists generally very rightly oppose is a theism that isn't based on reason. It's simply based on some guy, you know, a few thousand years ago said, this is the way it is. This is the way it will forever be. And like, you know, there's no changing it. And like, so that, that, that theism, that belief in God, you know, is I think the, the source of, of so much of, of the harm that, that theism does. So, so like, you know, what I'm trying to do with pantheism is like, listen, you know, if we're going to kind of like, if we're going to believe in God, let's believe in God, not from a faith-based perspective, but from a reason-based perspective. And that means like – and that's not going to be easy for people because in other words, like, you know, the, my belief in God is fine. God is everywhere. God is all-powerful. But God is not all good. And just the fact that God is not all good is not going to be something that people are going to like to hear. But again, the, 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 the idea would be to kind of like – to simply – Take the magic from God. And like, if we're going to use the word God, because again, I think it's going to be hard to pull away from it anytime soon, then let's, let's shift it to a God that's based purely on reason. Right. But, it, but even when we say things like God is not all good, we're, we're, person of, we're, we're creating some uh, personification of, of something there. Uh, we're, we're saying that God is, you know... Um, is, is actually thinking. There's there's a, there's some kind of thought process going on there, and and that's what I think needs we need to move away from is is this idea that that we we stem from something that that is conscious. Um, 
so and then that and then obviously this is I think where we disagree on on some level is is the whole um, I think you think that there's some kind of tele, teleological uh, happening in the universe that that leads to our you know conscious creatures on earth um, and I think no it's a it's kind of a, a, just a process that's happening that that has no um, no thinking authority. Right, Dave. Dave, what's your take on this so far? Uh, I'm kind of agreeing with uh, what what Trick says, to be honest with you. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, when you say that God is uh, is like the universe, are you saying that like God is everything? Or absolutely, that God is in every particle, atom. That that God again, God is. If God is omnipresent. God has to be everywhere, and and that that also means that God cannot transcend the universe, as 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 traditional monotheists claim. Right, but if if you're calling God everything, and doesn't that kind of make the concept of God, uh, you know, kind of meaningless, kind of? Well, I mean, because I mean, basically, I'm not defining God as the creator, because like the idea of like whether the you know. Creation transcends logic. In other words, a point where like everything began, you know, we now, our minds would say, well, there must have been something before that. So basically, though, when we define God as omnipotent, then that refers to the laws of nature. In other words, like there's not a place, I think, in the universe where gravity doesn't govern or where the four fundamental forces don't govern. So from right. that perspective, you know, God would have to be everywhere to govern everything. But but is there a need to call that God? Could could you not just refer to it as as nature or some would, other kind of law of the universe? David, I would very much prefer you know to have it be that way, right? But but like you know my my um my I guess advocating for the personification, you know, well actually like there, no, there's two reasons. Um. One is like that, you know, just realizing that, that most people have a very, very strong need to believe in a personified God. Uh, but, but the other reason is I, I think I may also. In other words, like I, you know, being a person, um, there, there's a kind of a quote unquote dignity to, to being a person, being life. And, I, you know, I think I share this dignity with all other animals. There's, there's something that we're not just simply inert matter. I mean, like the universe is, is divided in into like what's what's a thing and what can be um, known as a person. So like I think being a person, I personally feel much more connected to reality by personifying the, the entirety of reality, by seeing reality not as like as as a thing, but as this this vast you know person thing or whatever. Now now for me. Oh, so go ahead, Chandler. Yeah, what I was going to say is, you know, it actually sounds like um, what George has, you know, the feeling of connection with, like, these other animals and stuff is really close to how I feel about it. Like that there is, you know, there are conscious living things, and that's where most of my focus is, is just, you know, improving the experiences of those living conscious beings, basically. I think if we're taking this back to the whole free will thing uh, and our understanding that we don't have free will, what we kind of need to look at is 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 causality itself. Uh, so so what's what's really important is trying to find out what are the actual causes that lead to whatever state. Uh, and I think I think it's it's kind of wrong to suggest that the causes that led to us, for example, are something. Um, Something of some higher level or something, something that 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 really is isn't isn't is more than dumb forces that are playing out. Um, and I, I agree that once once we're in existence, once once we've evolved and all that stuff, and we're in existence, we have we have these consciousnesses that are play play a part of the causal uh, role that that play out in the universe. So in that sense, we could say that the universe has kind of built in this conscious level but but before we evolved like um you know billions and billions of years ago before before evolution even happened on earth there was no conscious processes there was nothing nothing that can even 
we can even think of that in that way. And uh, and I think we have to look at the causality of such. And I think I think um, we either get that causality right or we get it wrong. <laughs> and, and to me, I think one is one is more right than the other view. Yeah, Trick, I, I've actually done uh, at least an episode or two on like defining God as causality, you know, basically like describing the causality that governs us because like, you know, just from a, a reason standpoint. But yeah, in terms of, of, of like the, uh, the consciousness aspect of, of the universe, um, one way I think there's two, two ways of, to, of approaching this. One is like, are we anthropocentrizing consciousness? In other words, like, for example, like, we define ourselves as intelligent because we can create computers and we can build buildings and all. Um, but we seem to want to limit that intelligence to, to human beings and other animals, not realizing perhaps or not giving sufficient recognition to whatever process, whatever we want to call it, that created animals, created our, our brains and our, you know, our beings – I think, you know, reflects an even a, a much more vast intelligence than, than any human achievement. Um, see, I, um, I, see I, I look at these words like created and, and I, I find those words problematic in, in that it wasn't, it's not really a creation aspect. It's, it's, it's just a processing aspect. It's just no, something that – I agree with you, Chair. I agree with the trick. But like for example, like – so I could say rather than creating, I would say evolving. Right. So in other words, like, you know, the, the, our, our being, you know, as animals and our, you know, with our intelligent capa capabilities evolved over, let's say, um, a couple of billion years. But, but here's the thing, like, um, a couple of billion years relative to like a, a conceptually possible eternity it's kind of equivalent to like our, let's say, creating a computer within a year or two. Because like, you know, like from a certain perspective, one might also say, well, the, the computer evolved, you know, not intelligently because like, you know, a year could be stretched out, you know, to, to, to represent, let's say, billions of years and all. So, so I, think, I think that the consideration is time. So in other words, evolution, you know, is a process that takes much, much longer than what we human beings would would do with our quote intelligence, but I think the the results are you know can be viewed as equivalent relative relative to I guess the, the eternity in time. Mm, I, I mean, if if you're looking at billions of years, I I, I it, it doesn't it wouldn't matter how long like like how expansive or how long the universe existed, for example. Uh, the only thing that that's factored in is the billions of years that uh, that evolution takes place in. It's 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 not it's not relative to some expanding uh, thing that that we can say, oh, this is smaller now because it's because we're looking at it at, in some other uh, greater perspective. We have to look at it just at the in the in the time frame that evolution takes place in, and we know the mechanism. We know we know what's what's happening for survival of the fittest and all that stuff for, for uh, um, how a, uh, uh, a molecule uh, reproduces, basically. So, all right, well, all right, so, like, I mean, like, then we have to kind of, like, um, we have to agree on what are, what's the criteria for an intelligent act, because, like, under certain perspective, you know, like, the, the, the multitude of mechanisms that, that nature has evolved to to ensure the survival of, of a multitude of species, you know, from camouflage to to replication to you know, there's so many different kinds of mechanisms that are directly involved in the process of survival. So yeah, the ha but, but yeah, it's let not, me finish, Rick. Let okay. me finish. So how do we how do we, you know in other words, what what is it about human intelligence that is fundamentally different from that those kinds of processes? Okay, we've got to first be clear that it's not it's not evolving for survival. There, there's no evolving for survival in, in ev evolution. So um, basically, what's happening is the things that are surviving are pro propagating onto the next uh, to the next uh, generation. Uh, but it, but it's doing it in a really reckless process where where 
there's lots and lots and lots of unsurvival. There's lots and lots and lots of death that's going on. So, so it's not it's not like we're saying that that it's that things are just evolving to be like survival mechanisms. Um, they're they're evolving because the survival mechanisms happen to be the things that that carry on to the next level. Out of you know because that's the thing that leads to to the creature that to be able to procreate <laughs> to the next level. <laughs> it's just it's just it's just all process. It has nothing to do with with actual survival. The survival just happens to be the outcome of it. But Trey, couldn't we use that same rationale? toward human experimentation, scientific experimentation. For example, before developing some kind of a cure for something, you know, a scientist, a medical scientist did um, a thousand or two thousand different tests. So in other words, like it was a, a vastly mistaken process, just like you're saying with evolution, but it results in, in a certain, you know, success. So, I mean, like, is, isn't the most scientific um, perspective on evolution – that um, we have no evidence that it's – I mean th the same kind of evidence we have that, that our scientific um, exploration is, is an intelligent act because like it, it, it um, res results with certain um, you know, conclusions or, or outcomes. You know, that's the evidence we seem to have for, for evolution. But like it seems like – that it that to 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 assert that it either is a purposeful or an unpurposeful act, I'm not sure we have evidence for that. And I'm, in others, the other part of this, for example, like you know, in terms of like seeking out the evidence for um, evolution being a pur purposeful act, one thing we have to recognize is that like, let, let's say we were um, in a room. And there's like boxes everywhere in a room. We're looking for a, a, a set of keys under a box. Okay, but let's say, you know, we look in only 4% of the room under like 4% of the boxes and we conclude, no, the, the box, the keys aren't there. I'm not, I, mean, I think that we can conclude that that wouldn't be a justification for concluding it's not there. So again, like with, with evolution, because we are as human beings only – even with our most advanced technology, aware of only 4% of the universe, the known universe, I'm not sure we can like definitively claim to, you know, for certain things like, like, and again, to claim that something either is intelligent or processed or not, um, make that assertion based on, on, on just an exploration of, of 4% of reality. Yeah. But that, then, I mean, you're, if you're talking about an existence claim, for example, that, that there's some conscious process going on, then that kind of holds a ton of burden of proof there. Um, from everything we've seen so far in the universe, whatever, even if it's just 4% or, or whatever, um, everything we've seen outside of the, the creatures on planet Earth, we, we don't see any conscious processes. We see... Uh, fusion in the star, and we understand how how what that comes to be through um, through atomic you know collision and all that stuff. So we 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 recognize that all these you know all these um, the momentum of matter and energy and and gravity and and all this stuff. We understand that it's 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 just part of physics, but there's no conscious process to it. Um, to extend that to the uh, 90 whatever percent of, of the universe that we haven't discovered yet and, uh, and then say, oh, we can't know because we haven't discovered the rest of the universe, kind of, uh, uh, to me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You, you, we have to look at what we have evidence for and what we don't have evidence for. And if we don't have evidence for something, for example, some uh, creator or, or some, some, some thinking conscious uh, process that's happening, then we have to kind of abandon that at least until we get that kind of uh, we we explore that. Uh, when we explore that and we find it, then then we can assert these things or we can even suggest them. But I don't think they're even suggestible at this point. Yeah. Again, I guess I guess just with you know like as with the term free will. How it has different meanings um, to different people, and I think there is a correct meaning of free will that, that I think we're advocating. The same I think would go for um, God or consciousness. I think that like you know 
it's it's a, we have to determine whether we're anthropocentrizing our views or anthropomorphizing our views, and that's so. I think, and again, like this, this is an exploration that I haven't like you know devoted much time or attention to. I think it, it requires you know. I would like to explore this in a lot more detail. Chandler, I guess we're about to end of this. Oh, yeah. Well, it could, is there time for me to say one more thing? Absolutely. Yeah, about the anthropocentrizing and all that. That's something that I noticed is that, you know, God is describing human terms because humans are the ones, you know, coming up with this stuff. And I think that, well, a horse has a horse god, a dog has a dog god, you know, that sort of thing. And so that just shows right that there that our biases and our experiences form our beliefs. And it is also why it's important for that, you know, I know I don't blame or hate anybody for their beliefs. They're just – of course, they're just trying to make sense of the world. And I think that you're right that that's what people were doing when they came up with the ideas of God. They were just trying to explain what they saw, and we're, we're doing it in a different way because we have different information. Excellent. All right. So I think like, yeah, next episode, let's let's um, move to something we all agree on, kind of like like how what what should our messages be to people to help them understand that absolutely nothing is up to us. All right. So Chandler, you want to end it? <laughs> oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, this I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Free Will, Science and Religion. Bye.